uh, those funds on to uh, the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation, which is our local um, uh, independent uh, medical research funder. Uh, and they um, sort of cast around for a while deciding what to do uh, with those funds and decided to form something called the Van de Veer Institute in honour of, uh, of, of CAS. Um, and it was called the Van de Veer Institute for Parkinson's and Brain Research. And that was back in 2004. So we've been in operation since then and have managed to survive, uh, uh, despite some scepticism that we'd be able to, to, to keep this independent organisation running over that period of time. Um, but in recognition of the fact that it has, has grown and the work that we do is uh, operating more on a national and an international uh, scheme, uh, in 2011, uh, we were renamed to the New Zealand Brain Research um, Institute, uh, which still has a strong focus on Parkinson's, but also a variety of other uh, brain disorders and, uh, and, and the ways in which the brain works uh, in health and disease. So you'll hear from a variety of, uh, of researchers uh, today to give you a flavour of the kind of work that, that we're involved with. Um, so the character of, of the Institute and, and the vision behind it was to put together people from a variety of different disciplines and different organisations. So prior to this, um, brain research happened certainly in Christchurch and Canterbury, but it was spread across multiple departments and institutions. And the idea was let's bring everyone together in one building, uh, get them working together despite uh, the different backgrounds and, and, and organisations that they came from. And so from the beginning, a very strong uh, characterisation of, of the organisation is that it combines both clinicians and researchers. And clinicians, both from a medical point of view, but also from a variety of other disciplines such as uh, um, physiotherapy and speech therapy, radiography and, and, and nursing. Um, along with scientists, again, from a variety of different, different backgrounds. So there are uh, people uh, like myself who are trained uh, in experimental psychology, but uh, a key um, aspect is bringing uh, together people who've got that clinical focus with people with great technical skills from domains like phys medical physics, uh, electrical engineering, uh, math mathematics, and so on. Uh, so bringing those people together and seeing what will occur uh, as a result. Um, and uh, we have a variety of people supporting us, uh, uh, doing the face-to-face -face assessments um, and keeping, uh, uh, keeping us running from a um, financial point of view. But probably most crucially, uh, we have uh, currently about 16 graduate students, uh, and they do the real work, to be honest, and they come from both uh, primarily the universities of Otago and Canterbury, but we also host, upon occasion, students from Lincoln and, uh, and Auckland who, who come to uh, Christchurch to, uh, uh, to carry out their research. So um, what I'd like to do uh, today, and I guess what um, is the evidence of that is uh, are the rest of the speakers that you'll hear uh, this afternoon um, who are coming from a variety of those different perspectives and covering different topics. Um, but what I'd like to talk about uh, this afternoon is uh, the most uh, substantial uh, piece of research that we carry out at the Institute, which is uh, the Parkinson's Progression Program. And this has been running since 2007, and the goal is to follow people uh, with um, uh, Parkinson's uh, disease uh, as the disease uh, progresses and they experience changes uh, uh, in their status and, and, the, and the difficulties that they experience. Um, but, and we are following them both clinically with a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, uh, assessments, but also some high-tech assessments such as MRI and uh, EEG brainwave recordings and so on. So um, it started off really as a collaboration between uh, the Department of Psychology at the University of Canterbury along with Medical Physics and the Department of Medicine at Otago. And both of those organisations have been doing Parkinson's research, but in a relatively boutique kind of fashion. And it was bringing uh, those groups together in one place that really allowed it, uh, us to lift what we're doing. And we now have a very substantial study uh, um, following uh, a group of patients since 2007. So since that date, we've seen 343 uh, people with Parkinson's. Uh, and really crucial to that, uh, we also see uh, family members, spouses and caregivers who are, are a very important part of our research uh, in terms of us understanding what's going on. Um, and equally vital are healthy older controls because we really do need uh, people from the community who don't have Parkinson's in order to form a, a useful comparison. Uh, and currently, unfortunately, by the nature of the disease and the fact that we're dealing with older people, uh, a variety of those original uh, participants have passed on, and we're currently following just under 200 uh, people with Parkinson's and 55 um, older control subjects. Uh, and just to give you a, a bit of a feel for the, the scale of it, so we've seen 417 people at least once, uh, through to some people here, we've got our first person that we've seen 10 times over that period, so that's um, generally one to, one to every one to two years. Uh, so I just want to give you a, an overall feeling for this. Now this is again where from the, from the back you may not be able to see the details of this graph, but I'll just go over the vibe of the thing. So what we do is we get people in for about two days. We do incredibly intensive neuropsychological assessments, uh, which is really a way of, of determining uh, how people are doing with their memory function, their reasoning, uh, 
and, uh, uh, and their visuospatial abilities and so on. And we, um, over the course of about two days, we take many, many measurements, but at the end of the day, we can take all of those measurements, throw them together in one average, and we come up with a single number that describes somebody. Uh, and that should be um, uh, zero, basically, as, as average. And these are our healthy control subjects. And you can see, um, hopefully over time, that you have these green lines. And the, the big take-home picture from this is that our healthy older control subjects stay healthy. They stay at the same level of performance, really, despite their age. So they're running through from here, from their late 40s through into the 90s. And the good news is there is that most of our older people are doing quite well. Um, However, you probably can't see from the back here, but a few of these green lines start to turn yellow, and that's uh, moving into a condition we call mild cognitive impairment. That's the first step, potentially, towards uh, dementia. And one of our healthy control subjects has indeed, in their late 80s, uh, succumbed to dementia. So uh, what does uh, our group of Parkinson's uh, look like? We see quite a different picture. So um, first up, we do have the same sort of pattern, a large number of people there who are following along in green, maintaining reasonable stability. But... Uh, a lot earlier for some people we see, see these rapid declines, so many more people in that yellow zone of mild cognitive impairment uh, and then succumbing quite rapidly to dementia, which are the, uh, the red dots. So um, in some ways, of course, obviously that's a bad news story, but uh, also there's, there's good news in there. And we can see, hopefully you can see uh, right at the end here, we've got people at the very highest end of the age range. We've got one person who's tracking along perfectly well, another person who's um, you know, quite progressively declining. And so the real question to us is, can we tease out the reasoning for why some people progress rapidly and other people can maintain good health uh, despite having Parkinson's? And that variability is one of the key things that we're interested in researching. So um, I want to, uh, that's uh, looking at uh, people locally very intensively. I just want to follow up now by saying uh, it's important to look at the overall nation as well. Um, Parkinson's research in New Zealand um, started back in the 60s, well, this is the first paper that I'm aware of, really, a very important paper in the 1960s, and that looked at the age of people with Parkinson's. Uh, and generally, it's a, it's a disease of ageing, but there was also this cluster here of people who got Parkinson's quite early. Uh, and in the 1960s, that was still the case that we saw people who had a, sort of a form of Parkinson's uh, that arose from uh, an epidemic that happened at the same time as the flu epidemic at the end of World War I. Uh, those people no longer really exist. If you've seen the, the movie Awakenings, that's that same group of people with Parkinson's. Uh, we very seldom see those cases now where it's, it arose as a result of an infection. Nowadays, uh, it looks similar to this. People are, are, are older. Um, it's very much a disease of ageing. Uh, and in that paper, though, uh, this is 1966, uh, the question was raised then, does Parkinson's occur in a Māori? And they suspected it did, that they'd seen some Māori patients. But back then, in the, in the 1960s, uh, most Māori lived in rural areas, and this study was done in Wellington, and so not a single person was included in the study because there were very few Māori in um, urban areas at that stage. So it was unknown, really, whether uh, Parkinson's uh, occurs at the same rate in Māori, uh, and so we decided we needed to uh, examine that question. And so this is uh, our modern results, looking at the, um, the age structure of, uh, of how likely you are to get Parkinson's. And you can see that the good news is, uh, if you're under 40, your, your chances of getting Parkinson's are almost negligible, but uh, it very steeply rises as, as we get older, so this really is a, a disease um, of ageing. Now, this was uh, done over the entire nation of New Zealand, and, and so far that looks exactly like we see it in other countries. Um, but the interesting thing is what happens when people get into their 90s. And suddenly we see this dramatic decline. And uh, the question is, how can we explain that? Is that real? Um, we, we tend to think of this as a disease of ageing. Why would the, the rate suddenly plummet? And yes, that is corrected for the fact that obviously many people in their 90s just pass away for all sorts of other reasons. This is taking that into account. Um, and this is one of the best data sets in the world for looking at that because we pretty much got entire national coverage there, and so we get very good estimates of that decline, which previously was, was, was a little bit uncertain as to whether that occurred. Uh, so what did we do? Um, well, we did some epidemiology on the cheap, and the great thing about doing research in New Zealand is we can get access to big governmental data sets, and what we did is look at literally billions of prescribing records from Pharmac, uh, and did a backdoor way of looking at uh, the epidemiology of Parkinson's by who's prescribed different medications. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that, but it's, it's, uh, it was a very novel methodology which was created by uh, one of our local researchers. Uh, and it allowed us to basically, first of all, answer that question about uh, the rate of Parkinson's in Māori. And we can see here is that, that age curve. The red line up the top is for Pākehā, and the purple line down here is for Māori. And actually, the rates of Parkinson's we found are about half as high uh, in Māori compared to Pākehā. And uh, Asian New Zealanders and, and Pacifica were sort of intermediate. 
So the question there arises, is that a real thing again, or is this because of, uh, of, of lack of access to health resources and later diagnosis and so on? And that's an ongoing uh, um, area of investigation for us. Um, but that is such a beautiful curve, um, almost looks like a mathematical function. And so uh, uh, Dr. Campbell Leheron, who's one of the uh, local neurologists, looked at that, and he made the connection between uh, this curve and some analyses that have been happening in the cancer world since the 1950s, but in neurology we hadn't really caught up with. And there's a prediction there that if you get a beautiful curve that looks like that, uh, and you plot it, going back to high school maths, if you plot um, logs on each axis, if you get a straight line, it tells you something about how that disease is caused. And in fact, if it's a straight line, the slope of that line tells you how many factors lead to the disease. Um, now, that sounds a little bit magical, but let's see what uh, that looks like. And sure enough, we just take the log of each of those things, going back to high school maths, and we find something that looks almost perfectly like a straight line. And the slope of that line uh, tells us that there are seven causes, effectively, overall, uh, of Parkinson's. Now, there's a lot of research there that says there are lots of these risk factors. There's certainly not a single cause of it, but it starts to allow us to um, uh, uh, zero in on it a little bit. However, again, you might not see that at the back of the room, but the, the, the line doesn't perfectly fit, and we do know that people, younger people who get Parkinson's are likely to have sort of genetic uh, conditions that predispose them that way. And sure enough, we find that it, we, the, the best way to describe that data is with two straight lines, and that for younger people, uh, there are six steps really required to get the disease. For older people, it's eight steps. And that tells us really if you're a younger person, you get Parkinson's, it's probably because you were predisposed to it uh, as a, as a uh, result of uh, strong genetic influence. Um, but the real question there is that uh, for, uh, there's a really strong distinction in Parkinson's between males and females. So um, uh, basically we see two to one uh, male to female uh, uh, risk of getting Parkinson's. So this again is just us looking at the overall country. You can see there there's this big peak for, for men and a smaller peak uh, for women. Um, but the question is, can that mathematical technique uh, of looking at that, uh, uh, that data by turning things into straight lines, can it tell us why that is? The real question here is, um, are there different risk factors for, for men and women? Are different processes happening that mean that women are less likely to get Parkinson's? Uh, or are they just less exposed to those things? So we know that, for example, there are occupational risks, uh, things like welding, uh, there are sporting risks like um, uh, uh, head injuries and so on. And these are things that men are more, more likely to experience than women. And sure enough, we do the magical um, mathematical transformation and we find these two straight lines are perfectly parallel. So what that tells us is that men and women have uh, exactly the same number of predisposing risk factors. Um, and uh, what's actually different between men and women is that, sure enough, women are just less exposed to those same, to those same factors. So um, it's a nice story really of, I'm just going to skip through these um, because it all gets a bit too mathematical, I think. Um, but it's a nice story that shows that in New Zealand we're particularly well set up for doing this kind of research because often we think we need to be in a bigger country where there's a lot more resources, but also in New Zealand we're a small enough population that we can do studies like this and pretty much capture every person in the country who's got Parkinson's uh, and have got access to, to, government, uh, to government data that's not fragmented. So I just want to acknowledge the people who've, who have run that research. That's really been led by um, Dr. Tony Pitcher, who's driven our, um, our epidemiology program. And just to give you an example of how uh, things have worked through the Institute, she originally came to us after studying uh, individual neurons uh, in the basal ganglia, which is the part of the brain affected by Parkinson's. Uh, she studied them in rats uh, and stuck needles into those individual neurons uh, and decided that she didn't want to do that anymore and she wanted to work with people. Uh, so she came to Christchurch and ended up studying millions and millions of those. We put them together into uh, structures in the brain where we uh, uh, measure them with uh, MRI. So she became an expert uh, in um, taking uh, slices of human brains, but fortunately without sticking needles into them, just by putting people into MRI scanners. Um, but from there, then decided that the next step is to do this national level epidemiology to answer those big questions. And so she's really moved in the course of, uh, of a career from neurons to brains to an entire country. And the reason that that's uh, been enabled is uh, that she's collaborated with uh, Dr. Daniel Mile, who's a mathematician who invented that really novel uh, epidemiological technique uh, and uh, the fancy log-log um, graphs I showed you before with the straight lines, uh, that was a wonderful insight made by Dr. Campbell Leheron, who's a neurologist at Christchurch Hospital. So that really tight link between people coming from quite different uh, perspectives is really a key aspect of, of what's good about the Institute and why it's an exciting place uh, to work in and uh, why we're happy to share with you today some of the, the research that we're doing. All right, so I'll hand on now to a series of our other researchers. So thank you very much.
Holzer. Uh, I'm also uh, at the Brain Research Institute, uh, and I think a lot about taking pictures of the brain. So I think a lot about brain imaging. So I want to do something slightly different than what Michael did, uh, in that I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the methods we use, some of the techniques we use uh, uh, to look at the brain uh, at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute. So that's where we're going to start. OK, so uh, specifically, I'd like to talk about brain imaging. And we use two main techniques to look at the brain in, uh, in your skull while you're still alive. Uh, and we use two techniques, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. And uh, that's uh, an, an amazing imaging technique. It uses uh, magnetic fields and radio waves to create detailed images of the brain. Um, but we also use another imaging technique, which is called positron emission tomography, or PET scanning. And you can see that just over on the right side of the screen. Um, now, that does require the injection of radioactive material into the body, um, but it can produce some beautiful images of uh, function of the brain. Now, one of the main benefits of both of these techniques uh, is their flexibility. So by changing a few parameters, we can create a large number of different types of images. And these different types of images can tell us about specific aspects of brain health. So I'd like to show you what some of these images look like. So first up, we have uh, brain structure. So we can use MRI to look at the structure of the brain. And here's an example. That allows us to look at the volume of particular tissues, the size of particular structures, the thickness of specific regions. And these are incredibly robust measures of, of brain status, of brain health. So what you're looking at here uh, are three slices of the brain. So one is a slice looking sideways. Uh, the image in the middle is a slice looking front on from the brain. And the image over on the right is looking down on the brain from above. Uh, now, the nice thing about brain imaging or MRI is we don't just have to look at single slices, right? So we can put these together and we can essentially scroll through the entire brain. Uh, and that's what we have here. So this is starting at one edge of the brain and moving um, sequentially from one side to the other. So as we come in, uh, we can enter in through the ear. You can see the brain there uh, nice, nicely. Uh, you can see some eyes there toward the front. Um, you can see the spinal cord coming up. Um, you can see some of the teeth, the nose. Um, so what you can see is uh, quite high resolution, quite good detail from these types of images. But we can extend that out a little bit further. We can actually create three-dimensional models of the brain, um, which looks something like this. And so here, again, i just point out the nice detail. You can see that, um, well, this is actually my head. You can see my eyes were closed. You can see nice detail of the ears. You can actually see now some vessels coming up, feeding the brain with blood. Uh, and I've made a cut down the side of my head, and so you can look in and see that gorgeous brain um, <laughs> in all its glory. Um, but again, we're not limited to just structure with this type of imaging. We can look at function, or we can look at blood flow. Uh, and so one of our newer sequences allows us to look at how the blood enters the brain. So that's what I have here. So we're looking at the main vessels which carry the blood into the brain. And what we can do is take a look at actually how, and you can see in color here, how the blood moves through those vessels into the brain. And this is all done non-invasively. This is all safe uh, and, uh, and very um, straightforward to do. Well, actually, it's not that straightforward to do. But once you figure it out, it, it works pretty well. Right, so we can actually continue. So we can look at what happens when the blood enters the brain, and then as it continues up on its journey to enter into the tissue and then bring the tissue the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs. So we can look at how the blood flow arrives uh, in the brain tissue itself, and that's what we have an example of here. So this is a, a series of images which start at the bottom of the brain and are just moving up um, uh, to the top of the brain, starting at the bottom of the brain there on the left and to the top of the brain on the right. And the red uh, color that you see there is indicating where we see high levels of blood flow yeah, in the brain. Now, we can take this one step further, and we can start in, as the blood reaches the brain, as the blood, blood hits the tissue, and we can also look at any potential consequences of dysfunction uh, in that vascular um, tree. And so sometimes you can have many strokes, you can have blockages, you can have some sort of issue with the blood flow, which then will lead to some damage to the tissue. And we can pick up that damage to the tissue um, in this particular scan. So if you look over here, hopefully you can see on the left some uh, slightly lighter or whiter areas, which we uh, interpret to be uh, lesions in the brain as a consequence probably of vascular origin. 
And uh, over on the right there in red, we have automated methods to actually identify where those lesions are occurring. And we can use that type of information to look at aging or to look at disease progression and see how these lesions within the brain relate to disease progression. Right, so we can also look at how the brain is actually structurally connected. How is a region over here in the brain connected to another region uh, uh, across the entire brain? And we can use uh, an exciting technique called diffusion MR, and it allows us to create these uh, pretty pictures, but it also allows us to trace out individual fiber pathways. So how do we go from point A to point B? So this image, uh, I quite like this as an image as if you're looking all, straight on uh, to the brain. And color here indicates the direction that these different fibers travel. So if you look down to the bottom of the image, it's kind of bluish purple. But if you follow that up, it, um, that actually is a fiber which is traveling up from the spinal cord all the way up to the top of the brain. And this gives us very sensitive measures of how is, those, how is the connective tissue doing? Is it healthy? Is it starting to show some dysfunction or some damage? Right, again, we don't just have to look at structure, we can also look at function. And you've probably heard of functional MRI or fMRI, and this actually allows us to look at how the brain is functioning in vivo, right? So we can put someone into the scanner uh, and we can actually scan them with functional MRI. And what you see on the left is a result of that. So we've asked a person to go into the scanner, they've gone in for eight minutes. We've asked them to close their eyes, to not think about anything in particular. And what you see in yellow are different areas of the brain which are active, they're increasing their activity. So what we can see is that the brain is never actually at rest. It's always busy, it's always um, uh, being active. And so that's what you can see in the yellow. On the right, that's an example that's looking at the back of the head, and you can see the yellow and orange, or the yellow and red there, is indicating uh, where we see increased function when looking at a flashing checkerboard. So we see a flashing checkerboard in the area of our brain, which is responsible for visual processing, for processing what we're seeing, shows an increase in activity, and we can actually pick that up with the scanner and indicate it there uh, in red. Right, quickly, uh, changing from MRI, we also use, as I mentioned, PET imaging. Uh, and again, its flexibility is incredible, and that allows us to look at something called, uh, well, it allows us to look at proteins and how they are accumulated in the brain. So we have a particular protein called beta amyloid or amyloid. This is a protein which uh, it misfolds, it sticks together, it clumps together, and it kind of gets deposited in the brain tissue. Uh, and this is a uh, pathological hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So we see this occurring in Alzheimer's disease. Previously, we couldn't actually image this. We couldn't, we don't know if there's amyloid in the brain or not until recently. And now we can use amyloid PET and we can actually take a picture of the brain and see whether there is this pathological protein or not. And that's what you can see over here on the right. The image there in the middle, that's what a healthy brain looks like. Um, you don't see much amyloid deposition or accumulation there. And on the far right, hopefully you see a striking difference. There's lots and lots of red there indicating high levels of uh, amyloid accumulation. And that's what you would tend to see in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So there was a whirlwind introduction to the amazing imaging techniques which we use. Uh, they really do produce some beautiful images which are very useful. And at the NZBRI, we're using these in a number of different studies and a number of different diseases. So, uh, I primarily am also involved in Parkinson's, and so I use these different imaging techniques to try and tell me more about what's happening in the brain and how the disease is progressing. But we also use these techniques to look at things like Alzheimer's disease. Uh, also, if you go to the other end of the age spectrum, we use these images to look at child development, uh, preterm birth, very low birth weight. Um, but we also look at things like neuropsych neuropsychiatric issues, like depression or apathy or post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and a number of, of different things. Uh, so I think, actually I'll leave it there, but I just want to leave you with uh, the idea that these imaging techniques are great. They give us a unique insight into what's actually happening in the brain. We can look at structure, we can look at function, and we can use that information to tell us a bit more about disease, about aging, about development. Uh, and we do that at the NZBRI. So, thanks a lot for your time.
okay, I'm way better at running the um, complicated mathematical modeling than the PowerPoint. Don't panic. <laughs> So tonight I'm going to talk to you really briefly about some trauma research that we're doing at the NZBRI that we're doing in conjunction with the Department of Psychological Medicine. So at some point in nearly everybody's life they will experience a horrible traumatic event, which is really sad. But for the majority of people this will be followed by a period of really short term distress and then they'll just start to feel better and they'll move on with their lives and they'll be able to function as normal. Unfortunately for some other people, this short-term period of significant distress continues for quite some time and it may follow them throughout their lifetime. Accompanied with this long-term stress, there can also be other horrible, significant physiological and psychological outcomes. So what we're particularly interested in is the brain changes that accompany this period of stress and particularly the long-term implications of experiencing a stressful event. We're really interested in what happens to people after they've experienced trauma, but if they haven't gone on to develop any other major psychological problems. Our argument is that you can experience trauma, have no anxiety, no depression, no post-traumatic stress disorder, no feelings of hypervigilance, no feelings of inadequacy, no feelings of anxiety, and that your brain might still be experiencing some changes. So, if you're experiencing short-term distress, sometimes this can result in this long-term list here of terrible things. I'd particularly like to highlight the difficulty thinking and the hypervigilance. These are not necessary, necessarily something that will be picked up clinically by your GP or by even any of your friends, but it may be something that causes you some day-to-day -day discomfort. Obviously, the most significant and severe outcome of a traumatic event is post-traumatic stress disorder which is a horrible disorder where you're constantly plagued by flashbacks and anxiety and the inability to cope with daily living. So I just want to really briefly talk about the neurocircuitry that's involved in trauma. So there's three main areas of the brain that we're interested in. The first, the red area, is the orbifrontal or medial prefrontal cortex, basically the front of the brain. And what happens is, in a traumatic event, your amygdala, which is within that green area in the brain, that will respond and that will basically go crazy. Something bad happens and that part of your brain is lighting up all over the place. And it's the job of the red area, the prefrontal cortex, to calm the amygdala down. Unfortunately, what happens with trauma is that sometimes the prefrontal cortex won't do its job. So the amygdala is getting really stressed and being really active and the prefrontal cortex isn't calming it down. Then what happens is these connections are strengthened and strengthened and so every time there's another traumatic event, the prefrontal cortex again fails to calm down the amygdala and unfortunately the hippocampus, which is also buried in the green part there, remembers all of this. And so you think, okay, my brain's doing weird things, all right. But I'd like to talk to you about what this might mean daily. So, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. If there's an earthquake, your amygdala then fires and that's when you start feeling really stressed and anxious and you might start sweating and you might just be in a state of absolute fear, basically the fight or flight response. You need to do something about this. Your prefrontal cortex is supposed to come in and go, okay amygdala, it's all right, let's think about this logically. Let's just get under a table or something. And then, your hippocampus remembers, okay, there's an earthquake, I feel really scared about that, but that's okay, I can react and get myself out of here and get myself safe. Great, your neurocircuitry is working, congratulations. What happens, however, in someone who's experienced trauma, not necessarily with post-traumatic stress disorder, they've just experienced trauma, what happens to most of you when a big, large truck comes past? I'll tell you what happens. Your amygdala goes, oh my God, that's an earthquake. <laughs> and your prefrontal cortex goes, yep, pretty sure that's an earthquake. We should freak out. Let's, let's get out of here. Let's duck. And then your hippocampus remembers, oh yeah, truck, earthquake, okay. And this whole time, your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex and your hippocampus are conspiring against you and those connections are all strengthening each and every time a truck comes past. So basically, you're all stressed, sorry. 
So what we want to do is, okay, I'm getting to the point of why we're stressed out the entire city. What we want to do is we want to look at normal, healthy Christchurch people that were here during the earthquakes. It's now obviously 10 years on. If any long-term outcomes have manifested, we should be seeing them. And indeed, there is obviously a higher incidence of stress and anxiety and unfortunately also post-traumatic stress disorder amongst the Canterbury residents. What we're interested in, though, is not those people. Those people are under the appropriate clear of cl clinicians and people that aren't me. I'm interested in the people that are fine. They present to their GP and their GP says, you're fine. They present to psych services and they say, hmm, you're okay, you're not scoring high enough on the stress scale, you're okay. So what I want to do is actually determine whether you are okay neurologically. So we were very lucky at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute that when I returned from the UK, a um, huge study running out of the Department of Psychological Medicine had basically just completed an eight year follow up on people that were psychologically healthy at the time of the earthquake, but had obviously experienced the earthquake. And we got funding to pop all those people in an MRI machine and see what was happening in their brains. Now to investigate the um, threat response, so the fight or flight response, we unfortunately have to show people a lot of images. I hope you are all paying attention to Tracy's lecture. This is the one where the brain's all lighting up in lots of different places. It's functional neuroimaging. So we show people a whole lot of these really horrible pictures interleaved with really nice pictures. And what we're interested in is what the brain is doing when they see the nasty pictures. Because our argument is that if you're in a state of hypervigilance or in a state of fear, your brain's going to respond to those nasty pictures in a different way than it does to the nice ones. So this is my last slide. What we're looking at here is basically the results of that functional neuroimaging study. We've popped everyone in the scanner. We've showed them all these pictures. The blue is our Christchurch people. And this is what's happening in their brain when they see the not very nice pictures compared to the nice ones. Now, the thing is, with this task, every single person, no matter where they are, their brain will light up like this in response to the nasty pictures. That's just because your brains are designed to not really like that stuff very much, which is fair enough. So because we need to test whether this is actually a problem or not, we also scanned a whole lot of people in Dunedin we said, sorry guys, you've got to go through this because of Christchurch. Sorry about that. <laughs> so they all sat down and did the same thing in the MRI machine. And the red is the areas in Christchurch that are different to the areas in Dunedin. So the Dunedin people also see the nasty pictures and their brain doesn't really like that very much either. But the red regions, and I'd like to point out they're in that prefrontal cortex region, are the bits that are different in Christchurch. So this is very, very preliminary. We got these results on Monday night. So at this point, we're concluding that something is happening in Christchurch. We don't know how significant it is. It might be nothing. It might be just due to any number of other things that we haven't yet controlled for. But there is enough preliminary evidence to suggest that possibly there is some neurological implications for people that have experienced the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, it's possible from animal research that those prefrontal regions are involved in resilience and might go some way to explaining why some people kind of come out of this stuff okay and why some people don't. But again, it's very early work at the moment. So. Thanks. Mm. Okay, hi Louis. Um, I should volunteer for Nadia's study because I certainly do experience some of the psychological side effects from the earthquake from 10 years ago. Um, I'm Teddy Wu, I'm one of the neurologists here at Christchurch Hospital. Um, I, um, I work mainly at Christchurch Hospital, but I also do research in conjunction with the team at NZBRI. Um, my main interest in neurology is acute stroke um, and being involved in clinical trials that looked at um, an effective intervention for acute stroke. Um, so today I'm just going to take you through um, the journey we went through in the last decade or so um, in one part of the acute stroke treatment um, in Cochrane. Um, so, stroke concept of stroke is actually quite simple. Um, you have a clot um, blocking the blood vessel and the, um, stopping the blood supply to the brain. 
And because of that, there's a wider region of the brain that's um, underperfused or ischemic um, without blood supply. Um, and, and a small part of it is called the core, that's the brain that's already dead. No matter what you do to restore the blood flow, um, that part of the brain will not come back. Um, but the wider area called a penumbra, which is a Latin word for shadow, um, is the brain that's at risk of dying, but not quite yet dead. Um, but if you restore blood flow, that's the area of the brain that you can save um, and potentially reverse the problems stroke cause, uh, causes the patient. So this is a real patient. Um, it's not projecting very well, but there's a big clot sitting on the right side of the brain. Um, and this is the a video that I made from the perfusion scan, um, some of the concept that Tracy has talked about looking at blood flow. Um, and if you look at the video, concentrate on the right hand side, hopefully you can see clearly that there's a delay in the blood flow to that side of the brain. And because of that, that's causing injury to the brain. Um, so, so with time, traditional thinking is that the, the area of survivable brain reduces over time. So the core, the, the brain that's already dead, enlarges. Um, on average, about 2 million neurons die per minute of ischemic um, insult. Um, so if you don't get rid of the clot or save the penumbra, you end up with a large stroke and, and the patient would end up being quite disabled, potentially dying from the stroke itself. This is an unfortunate real patient from here. Um, you can see there's a large area of the brain that's delayed blood flow, um, normal brain scan initially, um, unsuccessful treatment, large stroke. And despite being in his early 40s um, and had a few months of rehab, he ended up being in the rest home. Um, so very poor outcome. Um, so st these types of strokes are the most deadly and most dis disabling. Uh, if left untreated, uh, about 80% of uh, patients will end up being either permanently disabled or, or even dying from the stroke itself. Um, and, and we do have effective medications to treat strokes, um, but in these subset of strokes where there are big clots present, it's only really effective in a small proportion, maybe about 20 or 30% of the patients that get this um, medication to try and dissolve it. Um, and the other thing is that you can only get this medication currently if you come to the hospital within four and a half hours of the stroke starting. Um, so it's quite limited as to what, uh, what these um, treatment can do. This is where the clot retrieval um, procedure comes in. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a minimally invasive procedure, gun through an angiogram. Um, so the operator literally put a wire through the blood vessel, take a few pictures, and put in the stent um, in a mesh-like uh, device through the clot, catches the clot, and pulls it out. Um, and it's, it sounds simple, but it took, took a lot, very long time to perfect. So this is actually shown here, a real pa patient's clot. Um, this is the, actually the first ever successful clot retrieval to be a picture of the clot from the patient's brain to ever be done in New Zealand from nine years ago. Um, and, and it's a two centimetre clot in the major blood vessel of the brain. And this is the first patient in my young career that I've witnessed coming and paralysed and walking out within a few days of a major stroke. Um, it's taken two decades of research to get to the point a few years ago. So six years ago in 2015 was a landmark year for us. Um, there were five um, research trials around the world that were pretty much published at the same time, showing that if you get the patient's clot out in time, um, you know, you can reverse the deficits um, that the patient's experiencing. So these are quite astounding results. Um, you know, 50% of the patients in the, in the trials uh, were either normal um, or, or, or have very minimal problems at three months from follow-up, um, reversing the, um, the, the debilitating um, effects of the stroke. And, and I'm pointing this study out not because it's, um, it's an Australian-New Zealand study, but this study uses, is the only study that used um, what the perfusion scan, so advanced fl blood flow scan, to select patients for, for this treatment. Um, so the colour schemes here are quite simple. Um, the, the green is penumbra. Um, there's no red near, but if you see a bit of red, that's the core. Remember, the core is the brain that's already dead, and the green is the, the, the brain that's savable. Um, so this was the only study that used this technique to select patients for treatment and was the most successful um, out, of the, all the five study, uh, out of the five studies that were presented six years ago. Um, give you a real life example. This is another young patient we had a couple of years ago. Um, she came in, she blocked off um, the biggest blood vessel on the right side of the brain, the carotid artery. Um, you can see she had a lot of green in the brain, so a lot of brain to be saved. 
um, but also a lot of brain to lose if you can't get the clot out. Um, the arrow there on the right is pointing to where the clot is. Um, and you can see on the angiogram, there's no blood flow beyond the, the, the major vessel, the carotid artery, got a clot out. And amazingly, on the MRI scan next day, there was no stroke, none at all. Um, full recovery, um, when she came in paralyzed. Um, and um, I like showing this next picture because she was using her hand that was paralyzed two hours before this picture was taken. Um, so absolutely miraculous uh, recovery. Um, so uh, clot retrieval up to a couple of years ago, we really only offered if you can have the procedure started within six hours because that's the timing that these five studies um, did um, in 2015. So it is a bit of a race against time, you know, to, to get the scans done, get to the hospital and have all the operators ready um, to get the procedure started. Um, and that's a challenge because, you know, the South Island is quite a geographically challenging um, place. Um, you know, we have patients spread out throughout the rest of the coast, um, further south um, towards Invercargill and also up in Nelson. And to get the scans done and transport a patient to us, have the procedure started within six hours is really, really difficult. It can be done, but, but it's, not, it's not easy. Um, so this is where that advanced scanning technique, you know, the perfusion with the green and the red um, maps that we generate um, comes into play here. Um, because uh, if the patient scan shows this beyond six hours, does it really matter whether it's six hours or not? Probably not, because it indicates that the brain's still alive and you can still save it. Um, and because of the techniques um, we use in that Australian New Zealand study, um, the overseas investigators then went on and did a couple more studies um, demonstrating that we can offer this treatment to patients up to 24 hours from the stroke onset. If you have a large clot, if you have a brain that's still viable, and the, the results mimic that of those patients were treated early on. So one in two patients with a major stroke with brain that's still alive will be normal in 90 days. So that's quite amazing stuff. Um, and and that, that really opens up a large window of opportunity to treat patients around, all around the South Island. Um, and, and we also have, um, using advanced um, a, a, a sort of techni a computer technique using telemedicine to assist patients. This is actually from Queenstown. Um, Queenstown can do this as well. Um, this sort of scan and, and get the patient flown over, have the clot removed and, and very small stroke um, for patients that get treated. Um, and the real life example, I like showing these. Uh, this is a patient from Invercargill, uh, as far south as they're gonna get, I think. Um, and and he, she was quite bad. She came in unconscious, okay? She couldn't breathe. Um, she had to be intubated, have a breathing tube down and be sedated, uh, put under general anesthesia. Um, she had a blockage in the basal, uh, basal artery, which is the main artery in the back of the brain. You can see there's um, survival of the brain, the back, uh, area in the back of the brain. Um, she had the clot removed, you can see the blood flow restored, um, and that was done at nine hours. Amazingly, she caught a commercial flight back home. Okay. So, yeah. so um, every time I say I think that's the end of our research, there's more. Okay, this is the case still. Um, so, so one of the things we're looking at here is can we go beyond 24 hours? You know, so we are in Christchurch, we are collaborating with some international colleagues um, looking at um, some of the patients, we, we, we use this advanced tr uh, scanning technique and treat it beyond 24 hours to see whether it improves, um, pay, uh, the, the outcome is as good as those done under 24 hours. We published um, early results, um, but hopefully we'll have more data to show you um, in the next few months. And, and the other exciting um, trial we're involved in is, um, you know, because we so far have been using these techniques to, to look at patients whose brain looks still viable, what about the patients who have a lot of red, you know, not much green? Um, uh, you know, these patients have been excluded from uh, the trials that I've shown you so far, and these patients have not been treated because the brain's already dead. You know, there's probably no reason to, to do this. Um, there's also a risk of causing harm if you treat some of these patients. Um, and, and that may not be the case. Um, this is a patient we, we enrolled, recent patient we enrolled into this international study that was run, that's been run from Texas in America. Um, she came in, she's 82, um, there's a lot of changes on the CT scan and, you, and this is the area of the brain that's already um, dead. You know, quite, quite a large, sizable part of the brain on the right side. Um, and, and she was in this trial and actually received clot removal, um, the blood restored, 
and she walked in to see me three months after the procedure. Um, when initially, when I saw her scan, I didn't think she was going to get a good outcome despite having the therapy done. Um, so this is this is really, you know, extending the boundaries of treatment that we have for patients here. Um, so, so these are some of the exciting, res exciting research we have. Um, hopefully, it will enable more um, patients to receive the effective stroke intervention. Thank you. A couple of years ago, I came in in the middle of the night. She's 80, uh, with two clots in the brain, and uh, she was Teddy's team retrieved the clot, the clots plural, and she came out um, as she as she was before she ever had the stroke. So pretty amazing. So Teddy's a stroke neurologist. I'm also a neurologist. Uh, my name's Tim Anderson, uh, but I'm a movement disorders neurologist. I look after people with problems with movement, and including Parkinson's disease. And and uh, you heard from Michael that uh, Cass van der Veer had Parkinson's, and he was our major donor. Um, but actually, he was looked after by Ivan Donaldson before me. Uh, and so Ivan was my mentor uh, and encouraged me into this area, which I'm in. So I'm forever grateful, Ivan. And Ivan's here today and uh, is on our board. But I'm going to talk about Huntington's, not as common as Parkinson's. Um, and I'm sure you've all got um, someone that you know who has Parkinson's. And some of you, uh, not so many, will know someone with Huntington's. Um, and I'm going to talk about that condition. It's, um, uh, it's an increasing disorder. and, and I'm going to tell you why that is, and the, the, the title of my, of my talk, if you can see it, is New Hope on the Horizon, and I made up this slide two days ago, and uh, things have changed a little since then, since yesterday morning, and it's New Hope on the Horizon, perhaps. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll go into the reasons for that. So um, the name comes from George Huntington, who was a, a doctor, a phys just a general practitioner in the States, and he wrote the, the first description of Huntington's disease. But in fact, it was his father and his grandfather, who were both doctors, and he took over their practice, um, who, who, actually, who actually looked after patients with Huntington's, but he was the one who, who first described it. Um, and you probably don't know much about Huntington's. Basically, there are three main features to people who have Huntington's. Firstly, um, they have involuntary movements, which are not like tremor of Parkinson's, but more um, jiggly movements. And um, I'm going to show you um, a video of... Uh, so these two folks on the right have these involuntary movements. They're father and son. I saw them just a couple of weeks ago, and the woman is, is, is the mother and wife. And you can see these movements, which interfere with movement and, and unsteadiness. So the, the son developed his problem at about the same age, at the same time, I should say, as his father. And the reasons for that uh, I'm going to me explain. Um, and the reason for that is one of the reasons why Huntington's is becoming more and more prevalent. The other problems, apart from those movements, is that in time, people develop cognitive decline and eventually dementia. Uh, and uh, behavioural problems as well, so many people may get depression or psychotic illness. So it's not a pleasant condition, and, and many, but not everyone, will lead to premature death. So Huntington's, unlike Parkinson's, where there is a genetic um, component, Huntington's is very much a genetic disease. It's passed on in families, and um, if the father has a gene or the mother has a gene, they will pass it on to half the children. The children have half a chance, um, of 50% chance of, of getting the bad gene um, from their, one of their parents, the affected parent, and they get the normal gene um, from the other parent. So you have two um, pairs of genes, one with, with the mutant, it's called the mutant gene, and the other with the normal gene. Um, and we all make Huntington protein. In fact, all our genes basically make proteins, that's what they're there to do. Uh, and one of the proteins our genes make is Huntington protein. And you've all got Huntington protein in your brain. It's normal to have it, and we need it for normal brain function. But if you have the abnormal one, the mutant Huntington uh, gene, which makes the mutant Huntington protein, then your brain will start to get um, it will go awry, and you'll get the problems that I just showed you on that video. So, so children of affected parents have about a 50% chance. They either get it or they don't. Um, 
the thing about Huntington's, it, partly, well, there's quite a few things about Huntington's. One is that it, it's, it's more prevalent in different parts of the world. That's because there's basically a founder effect. So Huntington's probably started off in one person many, many um, centuries ago and gradually spread through um, parts of the world. It started in Caucasian population. And so it's more common still in Caucasian uh, or populations which have a large Caucasian um, element. The age of onset varies uh, because the size of the gene, of the mutant gene, the bad gene, is different in different people. So it's called an expansion. So the gene is a, a repeat, so that there are some what's called nucleotides that make up the gene. And for all of us, or most of us here, if you haven't got Huntington's, you'll have a number of about 18 from your, from your father and about 18 or 17 on average from your mother. But it varies. So, uh, you know, one person here might have uh, from her mother um, maybe 14 and from her father 18, but you'll be fine. So there's a little bit of variation. But in Huntington's disease, the gene is expanded and it, it, it expands, if, if, it, if it's expanded into an intermediate zone, you may not get Huntington's at all um, until you live to a very um, old age. The other problem um, in Huntington's genetics is a, something called anticipation. So you might have um, a gene, especially if you're male, you may have a gene that isn't going to cause Huntington's in you because it's not quite big enough. It's sitting on the edge, on the cusp. But when you pass that onto your children or one of your children, it can get bigger in that passage from one generation to the next. So you might um, have a gene that's of a length of let's say 37 or 38, which puts you in a sort of intermediate zone, whereas, whereas if you live to 100, you might get some symptoms. But your child, may, when you pass it down, may have a bigger one. And that person, put it over 40 in size, and if you've got 40, you're going to get the condition in due course. So that's why the father and the son um, developed their condition at the same time. The father um, had five... Um, repeats less than the son. When he passed on his gene to his son, he gave, it a, he gave him a bigger uh, repeat length, and so they developed at the same time. So that's um, one reason why um, hunting is getting more prevalent, because uh, down the generations, the gene is getting bigger, and more people have time to develop it as they get older. So the smaller the gene, the, uh, the less chance you have of getting it until you get very old. Um, and so hunting is becoming more prevalent. And so now we're seeing people in their 70s, 80s, and even someone uh, we saw last year who developed symptoms at the age of 90 uh, because that, that, that person only had a small number of repeats but just over the margin that, that causes the, the Huntington's. So we're seeing increasing numbers of people with Huntington's as, it, it, you know, as the years go by. Um, so it's becoming more prevalent. This is just showing you what I've really explained, and you won't be able to see it much, um, but... Here's the expanded gene, it's, it's larger in the person who's going to get Huntington's, and here's a normal sized gene. And as I mentioned, if you've got a number over 39, you're going to get the condition. It's inevitable, as long as you don't die at, you know, at the age of 30 from something else. But there are these zones um, in the middle between normal repeat number, which is less than 26, and over 39, where there's A, reduced penetrance between 36 and 39, which basically means that if you live to be old enough, you'll, you'll get the condition. Or you may be in the unstable um, area, this is 27 to 35, where you'll never get the condition, but as I mentioned before, when you pass on your gene to the next generation, you might be passing it from the unstable zone into the reduced penetrance zone, and therefore that child of yours may get the condition if they live to 80 or 90, and that person, when they pass on the next generation, can pass it on into the affected range. And that's why it's getting more, more, more common. So we need to do something about the gene, if we can. And that's where the new hope um, has come in. It's, it's working on the, on the gene itself. Well, actually, at the moment, it's working on suppressing the gene, uh, translating that into the protein. Remember I mentioned that um, that it, we all have Huntington protein, and the genes basically encode for proteins. They're there to make proteins, Huntington protein, which we all need. This, this new form of treatment called antisense oligonucleotide, which you may read about, um, is an artificial DNA that's made in the lab, and it, and it can be injected into the spinal fluid, where it can then go to the brain. And what it does, it, it doesn't do anything to the gene itself, 
But what it does is it interferes with the messenger that goes from the gene to the protein factory in the cell. So the gene encodes for that protein, the hunting protein, but it needs a little messenger, a courier, to take it from home, if you like, to the factory, the ribosome which makes the protein. And this particular type of treatment interferes with that messenger and stops it getting to the factory to make the abnormal protein. Uh, and so you can reduce the, the, the bad protein. And that's what um, we, we have, have known in the last year or two that can happen. And there was a study um, made by Roche just a few years ago with about 40 people with Huntington's where they dosed people into the spinal fluid with this treatment and reduced the amount of Huntington protein in the fluid by 50%. And in animals that looked as if it worked and, and, and slowed down the course of people's Huntington's. So there's been a lot of hope um, this will work in humans. And so we've been participating um, in a study, a um, worldwide study of 800 people with Huntington's, uh, which has been running for almost two years, treating um, locally nine people with Huntington's uh, with this treatment, lumbar punches every two months, injecting this material. So here's um, our anaesthetist Susie Newton, putting a lumbar puncher needle in, and we're collecting some spinal fluid for analysis, and then we're injecting this treatment into, uh, into this patient of ours. He doesn't mind being seen. And we do a lot of tests, and that's me on the right doing this movement, and that's him on the left with slightly slower movements. And we, and we do this every two months to see if things are improving or at least slowing down. We don't know the result, well, we didn't know the results of the study, it was still ongoing, until yesterday we got this message um, from the company Roche to say that we had to stop giving the treatment, even though some of our patients have almost finished their two years' treatment, because there's been some signal, um, unfortunately, sadly, uh, that tells us that it either it's, it's not effective enough and or there's got some problems with it. Not serious problems, but enough to stop the study. So it's been pretty devastating for us, actually, I have to say, um, having this treatment and for, of course, our patients and the Huntington's community. But I don't think it's too devastating yet because once the, the, the um, data is analysed, there may be signals of who should get the treatment and so forth. The other thing is that instead of trying to, to stop the messenger, um, you can actually, these days, potentially silence the gene itself with other forms of treatment. And eventually, you would have heard of gene editing, and there's a potential to cut the gene out, the bad gene and not the good one. Because the good one's still making normal protein, and you want to cut the bad one out. And we think there's hope for the future, but at the moment, there's a little bit of a stall. So that's my message. I don't want to uh, leave it on a sort of pessimistic note, but that's science. You know, uh, two steps forward, one step back. Hi, I'm going to stand here if that's okay so I can show things on the screen. Can you all see me? Awesome. So, Tina Koto Katoa, I'm Catherine Thais. I work at the University of Canterbury in the um, School of Psychology, Speech and Hearing. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight because I'm here to talk about an area that I'm very passionate about, and that is communication disorders. So, effective communication is incredibly important because we use it every day um, to just stay connected with other people around us. But unfortunately, talking and listening um, does not come easy for everyone, and some people have problems with communication. And so we know that that is far-reaching consequences, because if you have problems with communication, your social networks will diminish. Um, you may start presenting with depressive symptoms, um, and so overall, you will feel a lot more unhappy. So in addition to problems with mental health, we know that people with communication disorders can um, also have more physical problems. So uh, it can also affect physical health because if you don't know how to communicate well um, or you have some struggles to explain to people how you are feeling, what is going on, you may not immediately get the right treatment. And so we know that people with communication disorders can see some negative consequences um, of um, different treatments, not receiving them on time. So we see more hospitalizations and it can even lead to increased mortality over time. 
So because of that, we are doing lots of studies uh, to try and improve diagnosis, but also treatment of communication disorders. And one area that I will focus on uh, tonight is stuttering. So most of you will know about developmental stuttering. So that is what occurs um, mostly in preschoolers uh, when they start to repeat words over and over again, and they can repeat sounds, and sometimes they, their mouth can seem stuck when they are trying to say things. We know that in children with developmental stuttering, there is a neural basis to their problems. So we know that there are differences in the way that their brain works when we uh, compare with children who do not stutter. However, we don't know what the exact cause of the stuttering is yet. In addition to developmental stuttering though, we also have something that we call acquired neurogenic stuttering. So this is when people have spoken fluently their whole lives, and then at one point they can have a stroke, for example, or traumatic brain injury, or they can have Parkinson's disease, and because of that they can start to stutter. So acquired neurogenic stuttering, unfortunately has not received a lot of attention in the past and because of that we don't have good criteria for diagnosis and we don't have any evidence-based treatments. So that's an area that we are addressing at the moment. So in the lab we are running a couple of different studies um, to really try and use a comprehensive approach. So to combine information around speech characteristics, um, but also results of brain imaging scans and combine those with treatment outcomes in both people with developmental stuttering and acquired stuttering. So to answer some of our questions. So one approach that we use is uh, we look at brain lesions of people who have had strokes or traumatic brain injuries, for example. So you've seen a couple of these scans before. Um, so in the image on the left here, you see a brain of uh, one of the people that we have worked with. Uh, so this person had a stroke and started to stutter following the stroke. So what we did is we created lesion maps. So we created maps of the lesion uh, that they had to look where that lesion occurred and to see how it was associated with stuttering. So if we create lesion maps of lots of different people, we can then do group comparisons. So we can do statistical analyses. And that can lead to images like the one that you see here, which is the result of what we call lesion symptom mapping. So the um, areas that you see here in the bright red, so those are areas that are significantly more associated with an onset of stuttering following stroke. And so these areas um, overlap with all of the colored areas that are underneath. I don't know if you can see those, but those colored areas underneath represent our minimal network for speech production. So they're brain areas that are really crucial to help us to produce speech. So and unsurprisingly, if people start to stutter, we see that they have lesions in those core speech networks. So what we have done now is we have taken this one step further uh, because as Tracy has mentioned, our brain um, with networks in the brain. So we have different uh, areas of the brain that are connected to each other and that communicate with each other to support different functions. So um, what is shown here is the result of lesion network mapping. So rather than looking at exactly where a lesion occurs, we are now looking at networks of brain regions. And so, all of these red areas here are lesions following stroke in people who started to stutter following their stroke. And then for each of those patients, we have created a map of all of the functional networks that are affected by that lesion. And so we have done that for every person separately, and then we look at the overlap in all of those networks. And so this gives us a little bit more information. Um, so in this case, we see that the areas are more restricted to motor control circuits, and we also see a bilateral representation. And so at the moment, we are linking these imaging findings with the imaging findings that we have uh, in people with a developmental onset of stuttering as well. So we are also linking our imaging findings with what we do in treatment and um, the treatment techniques that we use and how they are associated with different outcomes. So I think the best way to give you some more information about treatment is by showing you a couple of short video clips uh, rather than me explaining what we do. Um, so I think the videos are pretty self-explanatory. Um, so this is one of the um, 
people with neurogenic stuttering following stroke that I've worked with. And we're really fortunate to actually have a video of her that was taken one month before she had her stroke. So um, I'm gonna play a short clip so that you uh, can get an idea of what her speech sounded like. And we've got quite a few colours, mostly natural colours, black, navy, green, lots of cream. And like we've got 19 micron for people that know the wool. Uh, we've got 125 micron and we've got merino and silk. And okay, so I think that you've all noticed that her speech is really fluent. So she's a confident woman. So um, she's a salesperson who enjoys talking to customers and selling the wool. So um, this is a video of her following the stroke just before we started the treatment. About yourself and about what happened to you with the stroke. Uh, with my stroke, stroke, stroke. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> the the, the, the f f first thing, uh, uh, I was sitting uh, uh, on my chair at the, uh, uh, where I have my... So... I think that you all noticed the difference in speech. So she repeated a lot of words, but she also repeated a lot of sounds uh, as well. And so she definitely stuttered um, quite clearly uh, throughout the collection of the speech samples. And the problem for her was not really that she stuttered, but that she felt really frustrated um, because of the speech problems. And she started to completely withdraw from social context. So uh, she didn't want to participate in any social activities, but she also started to even withdraw from having contact with her family as well. Um, so a very different person compared to um, the first video. And then the next video is um, one of the videos that was taken during one of our treatment sessions. Oh. <laughs> I talked to my friend at this, then we had a cup of tea. Great. So we were practicing a technique that she could use to speak fluently. She did it really well. After that, we worked on removing um, the support systems and she um, yeah, made amazing progress. But even more important than the changes in her speech were just the changes overall. Like just because she felt that she could communicate again, she started to become a lot more active. She um, just was in touch with her children and grandchildren a lot more and started to participate in a lot of activities that were being organized. So to the point even that when she came to our treatment sessions that she often said that she was really tired because she had such a busy social schedule. Uh, so I just want to highlight that just by giving people a little bit of support and by teaching them techniques to regain communication function, we can really, really make a big difference in people's lives. So um, I think my key message today is communication is really, really important. So if you notice that people start having difficulties communicating, if you notice that more and more breakdowns in communication are occurring, don't just yeah, accept it but ask for referrals, go and seek help because help is available and it can really help people. Thank you. Kia ora everyone. Um, my name is John Darren Blawford, um, which is a bit of a mouthful, and thankfully most people just abbreviate it to John D.A. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be talking uh, more generally now about um, dementia and commenting very briefly on some variations of different types of dementia and especially risk and potentials for prevention, perhaps down the track. Now, um, the sad news is or all of the good news is, if we age, we're still alive, but the longer we're alive, the more we are at risk of dementia. So by far the sort of strongest risk factor for, for, risk factor for dementia is certainly aging. And you'll notice in the second line there that uh, maybe 3% of people at age, age of 65 might be suffering from dementia, and this doubles every five years thereafter. 
And the problem really is more to do with a severely truncated health span. The lifespan itself is not such a big issue. The question is the quality of health that people have once they actually uh, get dementia there. And of course, also then there's a huge impact on families um, and family and friends and of course, health resources. And of course, we, as we all know, the, you know, our population is aging and it's aging fast in terms of the relative number of people who are older, um, which is largely, largely brought on uh, by the baby boomers, such as myself, I must say. Um, and the issue is that where perhaps uh, in New Zealand there are in recent times 60 or maybe now 70 or 80,000 80, people, it's anticipated that this will be at the order of 170,000 by the time we get to 2050. So it's a major issue. Uh, also, uh, um, people in society are living longer, but Maori in particular are living much longer now than they used to. So their rate of uh, increase of the number of people who will be suffering from dementia is increasing markedly. And the diagnosis of people with uh, Maori with, de with dementia is generally, at this point in time, eight years earlier than Pākehā and about three years younger than uh, Pacifica. Now, of course, uh, all of us have the occasional memory lapse. That's fairly normal. And the problem for many of us is, as we age and we have a memory lapse, we immediately begin to think, oh, is this the start? Are we on the slippery slope here? Um, so it's normal for us to have some degree of forgetfulness. In fact, if forgetfulness is a major issue, then I can um, uh, uh, confirm that the majority of my students at university uh, must be suffering from dementia. <laughs> Of course, the problem is the severity of that problem. You know, if you forget to buy the eggs or you buy eggs twice, then that's not so bad. If you go and buy eggs every day of the week because you forget that you bought some eggs, then that begins to be an issue and a problem. So what's the difference then? What's the difference between sort of normal aging where our cognitive faculties might begin to wane a little bit compared to those who actually suffer from dementia per se? Well, the real difference is the extent to which this the broadness and the severity of the problems that you might have. And the real tipping point is the degree to which you maintain your own independence. So loss of independence in everyday activities, they're the critical difference between people who have now got to the point of uh, maybe getting a diagnosis of dementia versus those who might be having cognitive decline. And some people may be having a decline in their cognition and their general thinking that's worse than the average person of, of their age. And they may well be uh, on a path towards, um, uh, on, a, on a dementing path as it were, and towards the final diagnosis. So, the important thing to remember, though, is there's no one single thing that's dementia. There are many, many different reasons behind why people might be suffering from dementia. And there are many different kind of what's described we heard before about genes producing proteins. Well, some of those proteins or many of those proteins are obviously cr critical for a whole range of functions in the brain. And some of those proteins go awry in the brain. And a variety of different proteins tend to go awry in different kinds of dementia. So basically then, the important thing to remember is it's a group of diseases. The other thing to remember though, is that more and more we're be beginning to realize the commonalities across different kinds of dementias. In the sense that there may be also problems with the blood brain system. Uh, there may also be problems with neuroinflammation and all of these may interact in different ways. And even the different proteins that might be happening might be interacting in different ways to exacerbate the problem in front of us. So Alzheimer's dementia is the obvious thing that most people know about or have heard about. But in reality, Alzheimer's dementia per se is probably responsible, many people think now, for the order of 50% of those, you know, uh, that range of different dementing conditions. Uh, the other ones over here shown are sort of vascular dementia, where primarily the culprit is to do with blood supply to the brain. Uh, Parkinson, Parkinson's disease and related conditions may be responsible for a similar number. There may be a whole raft of other things, including alcohol and various kinds of uh, um, um, disease, disease issues that might, might occur. And there's a range of things that are called frontotemporal dementias as well, which tend to again have a different sort of classification or spread of different characteristics of different types of proteins. But the picture is getting more complicated than that. So very often what we do is we'd, we'd be looking at the actual presentation of the individual to have a hunch as to which kind of dementia problem the person may have. But in reality, some, sometimes what we've learned now is that people may have a similar cl clinical syndrome, but the cause may be slightly different. So for example, something now called late, where it's now been discovered that those individuals who are over 80 
then maybe about half of those might be suffering from something that's, res that's a, a caused primarily by a different protein misfolding or misbehaving protein compared to Alzheimer's disease itself, even though the presentation itself is very similar. And the other thing that's really come to the fore in recent, very recent times is as they've got more and more information and started to look at more and more different kinds of dementia conditions, we realize that really there is a, quite a degree of mixed pathology taking place. So even someone, for example, with Parkinson's disease may, may very well have elements of Alzheimer uh, abnormal proteins as well. Uh, people who've got, um, certainly those who've got the new one, the, the late uh, dementia condition, will also have a variety of other problems also. So mixed pathology appears to be a major issue. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because when we think about how to treat those dementias, very often the argument in the past has been, let's focus on the actual culprit, the abnormal protein itself. Now, you need to then understand that protein. You need to understand why it's misbehaving. You need to understand why the brain's not uh, dealing with that protein properly. But the issue then is that you tend to be narrow in your, th in, your, in your thought processes. You tend to focus in home in on one particular protein where there may be a variety of different other proteins happening too. So we need to have a broader view, as it were, in terms of those potential treatments down the track. So here's Alzheimer's disease. What are the two misfolded uh, culprits here? Well, one is called um, amyloid. And this is where there are sticky clumps of abnormal protein basically between the cells uh, shown over here. And then there are another group of another protein called tau, which creates tangles generally inside the neurons themselves. So these two different characteristics together mean that we can classify an individual as suffering from Alzheimer's disease. So the neuropathology, as it were, defines the fact that now we think this person's got Alzheimer's disease per se. And there's a big push to try to better understand how we can classify people in that fashion by identifying uh, these abnormalities. So Tracy, for example, talked before about how we can uh, visualize amyloid in the brain, um, and there are also now uh, opportunities to visualize tau uh, abnormalities in the brain too. There are problems with some of the other proteins. We're still struggling to actually have a, get a good picture on what they might be in order to have a better idea of what might be taking place. So here's a healthy uh, brain on the right, or rather from an individual who had been healthy at the top, and an individual who'd been suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And very quickly, you can see, visualize, a huge loss of brain tissue has happened. So with any kind of dementia, what will happen will be a progressive loss of brain tissue, and that, in turn, will give rise to a range of behavioral and psychological problems. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, though, and also perhaps in quite a few other uh, uh, types of dementing conditions, the problem really also involves this culprit over here. So a place in the brain called the hippocampus that was mentioned earlier. Now, I should say that uh, neuroscientists are probably slightly over-obsessed with the hippocampus. And the hippocampus itself, the name uh, translated means seahorse. So lots of places in the brain that we look at have unusual uh, Latin and sometimes Greek names, and all they are is a description of what the person at the time, the neuroanatomist, thought that they could see. So back in the day, someone decided that they thought they could see a seahorse. And the international language at the time would be Latin or Greek. So they translate that to hippocampus. And of course, these days, if you go around telling individuals that your focus is the seahorse in the brain, well, you sound a wee bit weird. So <laughs> telling them that it's hippocampus, nobody understands. It's a nice, comp comp long word, and that's OK. But there is actually, you know, I did identify um, someone who had actually dissected out the actual hippocampus and adjacent structures. And you can see it, does, it is a bit reminiscent of a seahorse when you look at it in that direction. So once again, what happens is that people focus on areas like the hippocampus, where here's a relatively healthy hippocampus, here's a loss of tissue associated with the hippocampus. The real culprit in this region of the brain probably is, is actually the cortical tissue just adjacent to it. And changes there might spread. And that's one of the problems with these proteins. When they start going awry in one place, they spread to adjacent places. And then from those, those places, they may, they may spread yet further. And so a lot of the problem that we have to deal with is try to understand how we can keep that spread in check. Here um, is a quick diagram of that misfolding that takes place. You might have individual um, molecules over there, and they may come together as small clumps. And then they may grow to be larger clumps. And the problem is, these may seed other clumps to occur in other brain regions. And so a lot of the focus is try to understand how can we deal with this? What can we do uh, uh, to address that problem? And thus far, we've not come up with any way that would generally address this issue. 
huge number of people are trying, and we will get there, I'm absolutely sure, one day. I'm not so sure if we're going to get there in my lifetime, but we're certainly going to make some progress towards how we can deal with that. So now we can switch to, well, if we're struggling with actually how to deal with the protein abnormalities and the other problems that occur, um, why is it, for example, that there are some people who have neuropathology in the brain, yet they haven't reached dementia? Why is it that some people, for example, uh, have low neuropathology, but their brain function or their cognitive function, the way they think, is relatively frail? And so lots of people are trying to understand how we can actually understand what's going on in this respect with respect to resilience when neuropathology occurs. Because strangely enough, lots of people will have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, but they won't necessarily have Alzheimer's uh, dementia per se. Now, many people think that if they have enough Alzheimer's pathology in their brain, they will get Alzheimer's. So if we live to 120, you're going to get Alzheimer's. Now, this might be an issue for the younger generation coming forth, certainly my grandchildren, where many people think now that those individuals probably might on average live to the, to the age of 100. And the older you are, remember, the more you are at risk in terms of Alzheimer's disease and other kinds of dementia. So how can we understand this in order to help uh, resolve at least some aspects of the problem to hand? And that's where this picture comes into play. When people look at the kinds of things that are associated with your risk of dementia, there seems to be a great number of different aspects that collectively together have a huge contribution to the total number of people who will progress to dementia over time. And some people think that perhaps there's about 35% of the risk is down to factors that we can modify. Now, if we can modify throughout our lives the risk of many of these factors, we would reduce the number of people who get to Alzheimer's or other dementias before they die. And at minimum, the hope is, it will defer the actual onset of that condition. Now, if you had a choice, you're going to get Alzheimer's, you have no credit. I'm sorry, you will get Alzheimer's. If you live to 100, you're going to get Alzheimer's. Would you rather get Alzheimer's when you're 80 or 70 or when you're at 100 when it might be the point of death? Now, most people would choose to be relatively healthy for a longer period of time. And it may be that many of these things that we're looking at here might have a direct influence on some of the neuropathology, but maybe what they also do is to enable your brain to be more protected against the neuropathology that will occur. So, for example, um, here's a lifespan view of the kind of things that might have an influence with some examples on the top of the list over here in blue, so that's early in life, is education. There is no question whatsoever that a high degree of education has a huge influence on reducing the prevalence of Alzheimer's and other dementias later in life, and certainly putting off the point in time in which that might occur in individuals. There may be many other things that are important too. For example, we've learned that uh, uh, good hearing is also a relevant factor. Now, quite the relationship between hearing and the probability of, of progressing to dementia or not is still slightly uncertain. Some people think that it might actually be something to do with the revert, what's described as reverse causation. That is, when your hearing or some aspects of hearing get worse, then maybe that might be a signal that there might be problems taking place. And if that is a signal, then that's an early warning sign that we can next then use to try to intervene to reduce the probability of someone progressing. There are other aspects too, though, a whole raft of things over here associated with your uh, vascular health, associated with how good your metabolism is, associated with things like, for example, um, susceptibility to diabetes that make a huge difference, and we know from work that's focused just on that, outside of the context of dementia, that that can have a huge influence in reducing the rates of those kinds of problems. And so reducing the rates of those kinds of problems will feed forward to reducing the rates at which people might then also be suffering from dementia later in life. We know also that inflammation in the brain might be important, and infections, and how we better treat those may play also a huge part and we know also that good and varied diet is important. In my book, if someone says to you, here's the specific diet that will stop you getting Alzheimer's, then I'd say, don't believe them. If someone says to you, a good, healthy, varied diet is likely to be helpful, I would say yes. But we don't yet know precisely what. And some of the problems is that some of the research focuses on one little thing, 
And what we're really learning more and more is it's a global picture. There's a huge raft of many different things that must add up. And the big problem, of course, is that it's easy for us to latch, latch on some single thing. So you think about education. Right, if you go to university forever, I tell my students, you'll never get Alzheimer's. <laughs> now, tongue in cheek, admittedly. But in doing that, we're focusing on an individual thing, when really it's a whole raft of things across our lifespan that makes a difference, and that could hugely drop, or rather put off before we die, whether or not we will get dementia later in life from one cause or another. Here's an example, then, of a relationship, an association between um, education, or years of education, rather, and your genetic risk. Um, among the many genes that might be influencing whether someone gets Alzheimer's or not, one of the top of the list is something called APOE. And there are different variations of genes, just like we heard with Huntington's. There may be sort of you know, uh, changes in the gene that might have an influence on your health. And if you have something called APOE4, if you have that variant, and if you have one or two of those, the probability of progressing to Alzheimer's later in life is elevated. And this picture shows a study that's looked at the relationship between those two factors, whether you have APOE4 or not, versus the level of education. And the differences here is quite dramatic. So this is a study from Finland, if I remember rightly, where if you had less than six years of education and you had that risk factor, then you had an increased risk, as you'd expect, of progressing to dementia later in life. But over here, if you had nine plus years of education, then irrespective of the gene that you have, you have a less likely progression to later dementia, even though the difference between the genes is still the same. So the genes is, are having an impact, but education is changing the level of that impact. So these differences are fairly dramatic, and similar kinds of research also takes, uh, is evident in many other areas as well. One of the questions also is to do with whether or not the education or the cognitive training or the cognitive experiences have to happen early in life. And there's some evidence like this, for example, that no even later in life, the level of uh, uh, complexity in your life may actually put off or delay the onset of dementia. And again, this is one of those where people are arguing, well, which way around is it? You know, is it that people who are cognitively more healthy are going to do things, and really that means they're going to stay healthy and they won't get Alzheimer's disease, as opposed to directly that will influence whether they will get uh, Alzheimer's or not. But nowadays what's happening is that people are starting to look more and more at various kinds of interventions. And the evidence so far seems to point to, once again, just as I showed earlier, a combination of things is important. Focusing on just one thing doesn't seem to be work working. Focusing on multiple things in people's lives seems to be having some degree of benefit. And this is kind of encapsulated here. So at the very center, genes are important. There's no question. That's who you are. But things interact with genes. And life interacts with what happens when you interact uh, uh, through, through the environment. So there'll be a whole, a whole raft of things here. Social activities, cardiometabolic factors, cognitive activities, general lifestyle, and nutrition will have an influence. And we know also that the environment itself will have an influence. So living in an air-polluted environment, there is evidence that that increases, on average, the rate at which that population will be showing uh, dementia. And so we end up with a, an idea, a, a, a situation like this. And this is what we need to do. So we need to have population health, as it were, at the center. But we need to be able to look at a variety of different things related to that. So it goes from clinical co cohorts, like the cohort that we have here for Parkinson's disease, through to genetics, through to metabolism related to genetics, looking at animal models to see if we can find ways to improve that abnormal protein metabolism when it occurs, all the way through back to population studies to actually learn what things might be helpful going back to the clinical cohorts themselves to see if that works. The message that many people say is the combination between the heart and the brain. And the usual thing that's trotted out is, which is true, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. But it's also true that what's good for the brain is good for the heart. Doing both those things, and the multitude of ways that we can do it, many people think is the way to reduce the wave of Alzheimer's and other dementias that are going to happen in the future here. So in terms of the new NZBRI, we are associated with something called the Dementia Prevention Research Clinic, um, where we're inviting people who might be suffering from uh, thinking and memory problems, more 
more than they might anticipate in order then to explore whether or not this is something that's indicative of someone who is in trouble progressing to one of those dementias that we talked about. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I please ask you to put your hands together for all our presenters this evening? Um, hopefully, you've, uh, there's been some uh, real takeouts from the presenters. Um, this is the first occasion that New Zealand Brain Research has actually done a public talk on this scale, and we have been blown away by the attendance. So, thank you for your attendance this evening. Um, you can understand the importance of research. My job as the commercial director is to find the money to undertake the research. So there's there's no free um, no you know no no freebies in research as I've discovered and I've been supporting this organisation for two and a half years. Um, the government substantially underfunds research, whether it be neurological or any other form of research. So we do need public support. Part of that comes from raising awareness of what actually happens in our own city. And tonight is a demonstration of some of the fantastic research that's going on in Canterbury. And from an NZBRI perspective, it's been going on for 15 years. Um, and as I've discovered as a, as a, uh, a passionate Cantabrian, so much of what's happened at NZBRI is not known to the, the people of this region. So thank you for raising your own awareness. Um, we want to raise money as well. Tonight's not about me rattling the bucket. It's actually visiting our website, coming to other events, talking to family, friends, to take away what you've learnt this evening and actually drum up some public support for the fantastic work that's happening. You'll see us doing other things, fundraising events, um, public talks. It's all about the education piece, which so many of our researchers have talked about. Once you know about these things and the fact that this research is undertaken here by some outstanding researchers, um, then you'll decide whether or not you're able to support their work. So do visit our website, our Facebook page. We're very active in all those aspects. Uh, I also want to thank to Papa Hora for hosting us, um, for the catering, this amazing venue which has been provided to us at no cost. Um, I'd also uh, like to thank um, Dr Cheryl Doig, our chair, board chair. This is the last official function that Cheryl um, is performing at. Uh, she does such a fan fantastic job for us. She's been our board chair for six years. Um, and on behalf of the NZBRI team, thank you, Cheryl, uh, for your contribution to this evening, which is really, really special. Um, thank you.